Well, thanks so much for being here. And I know Seoul is a great, attractive city that many of you probably had the temptation to move away. Um, I just wanted to start with by how I kind of direct the cooling of blockchain. So I kind of thought when Bitcoin came out, it's cute. It's like I studied Byzantine Voltarans for a really long time. I Everybody told me that's so theoretical, nobody's going to care. And I studied cryptography, and I studied security and privacy, and everybody told me that who cares about security, we only care about performance. And then now I see something that actually built, it's built on top of EFT and cryptography, and people rave about. And I was like, okay, that's kind of cute, but let's see how long this is going to live. And then when Ethereum came out, I really bought into that decentralizing spirit. And why did I really buy into that decentralizing spirit is I don't really believe anyone can be a benevolent dictator in any like, entity, any company. We have Google that studied as like, don't do evil, and they actually took it off from their tagline officially in the beginning of last year. And like the FANG, Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, Google, they have huge amount of data accumulated in their platform and they can do awesome machine learning stuff and learn great insights and sometimes they make our lives better and sometimes they totally creep me out. And I totally got this uh, excitement out of, hey, we can actually have, we don't have to be dependent on this benevolent dictator and we can have a data that is the key to our future. And one of the things I really wondered is what is what the heck is the fourth industry revolution? I get, I, I've been talking about blockchain for a while and I get this question quite often. It's like, oh yeah, I hear that blockchain is going to be the, like the leading power of fourth industry revolution. What the heck is the fourth <laughs> industry revolution? I, on the other hand, totally believe data is the key to our future. Having more data and learning better insight from it, I think it's going to make our lives better. And for that, I am excited about having blockchain-enabled decentralized platform that we can share private data freely and actually make our lives meaningfully better without sacrificing anyone's privacy. So why do we care about privacy now? Because I've been doing security and privacy for more than a decade and everyone told me that no one cares about privacy. Well, turns out people actually do care. AI development has enabled something that's definitely creepier than ever, how they can track people's faces in public spaces and how Facebook, of course, I don't think Facebook actually really needed it, the oh, yeah. whole Cambridge Analytica scandal, and 23andMe getting the investment and actually sharing their genomic data with their investor, people do care. People finally do realize what it means to have their private data shared without their control and actually do care about it. And GDPR and the state of California is following the regulations. So people's data privacy needs to be protected. And I'm not actually saying the regulation is the reason that we should do it, but I think regulation shows that people really care. So we have three goals. I wanted to give individuals the power and the control over their own private data. It's not that I'm going to give Google my data and they can know everything about my life. Google knows that I'm here giving a speech at this moment and they know my slides as well ahead of when you guys can see it. Well, maybe that's not the only option can I, I can have. I want to have more options. I want to have more control. And I also want to break the data free from silos and how different platforms lock up their data in their own silo. And what we can do by combining and merging this data and sharing this data has great potential. And I want that freedom to happen. And also, I want to help people to be compliant complying with the regulations out there. So here we have rational mind. And I think um, Professor Yung King's talk was a great segue to my rational life proof consensus. As much as I'm excited about blockchain and I totally drink the Kool-Aid myself, I don't believe 
more than two thirds of blockchain community is so honest and is going to do everything that you are told to do in exactly the way you are told to do. I think people are more, I don't want to say selfish, but they would rather take care of their own individual gains and achieve that if possible. So I want to build a blockchain that assumes that people are not necessarily nice and honest and blindly doing what they are told to do, but they actually have an incentive to do the right thing for the system. And we have a key storage blockchain that enables individuals to have more control and be able to track it and trace it. How their data is shared and used by whom for what purpose. And how we do all this without sacrificing anyone's privacy. We have homomorphic encryption library that is the world's best in the machine learning and analytics. And my co-founder, Professor Chang Chan, will come and tell you more about it in a few slides. So this is how our architecture looks. We're a chain agnostic. We actually want to help all other mainnet projects out there who have issues with working with private data. Say, if you are, if you have a great idea about saying, hey, I want to build this new system on blockchain, but I need to know something about your private life. Say, I want to build an awesome matching algorithm that will help us find a common time for us to talk about the future of, say, Ethereum. How do you actually do that without actually opening up the whole calendar items? We want to have this uh, area, like, like a layer two solution, by converting your data through our library, it's going to be transformed into a private, privacy preserving data, and your app doesn't have to worry about leaking any private information. You can do all the computations that you want in your app on homomorphically encrypted data, so you don't have to worry about losing privacy. We also will supply the tools, the analytics tools, that you can just go ahead and use. You don't have to learn any machine learning. You don't have to know anything about homomorphic encryption, but you can just go ahead and use the tool so that you can learn about the insights based on the private data without actually looking at the private data. I'm also, we're also offering the plugin, I call it layer 1.1. It's kind of the same layer as the Ethereum Casper if you're familiar with the Ethereum structure. Whatever blockchain that we work with, whichever mainnet that we work with, we can also offer the rationally proof consensus on top of the work. Um, it can be any proof of work, proof of stake, anything. On top of their existing consensus, we can have another layer for more finality support. So I already kind of explained where the inspiration comes from. The traditional Byzantine full Torrance con consensus assumes that less than a third of the community can go absolutely crazy. Not just killing the node, but they can actually fake messages and they can reorder messages and drop random selection of messages. But then the rest of them is, are absolutely honest and can do exactly what they're told to do. On the other hand, what I believe in is that we should actually assume that most people are rational, meaning that they will do what is the best for them and what is the, the, the best thing for their own interests. And we may have some honest people, and if they do, they actually help us with the performance, but we're not relying on their existence for the correctness. So here's an example of what rational users can do. And I call it gatekeeping attack because it's really keeping the gate closed for the newcomers to join. And as Professor Yongde Kim was saying earlier, decentralization can have many different meanings. And one of the things, and I think it was actually your question, um, one of the things that incentivization alone may not be able to solve really well is how do you control the membership? So one of the things that can happen in many blockchains right now is that they can do something terrible to the system and then be caught and then they kind of launder their identity and then come back as a new user. Which is a good thing in terms of anonymity, but it's actually a bad thing in terms of the incentivization of the protocol for correctness. So let's say we have a state-based consensus system and any newcomer has to make a deposit so that when they misbehave, the deposit will get slashed so that the consensus nodes will behave correctly. And you can find many POS-based consensus systems <coughs> acquire, uh, require this kind of deposit so that they can do the slashing punishment. 
if the block producers are the ones that pick the transactions from the pending pool to make a block. And you may be asking, isn't that the definition of block producer? It doesn't have to be. You can actually have a two-layer solution where there are block composers, and then block producers are actually validators to decide which block should be the canonical block. But if the block producers are the ones that pick the transactions from the pool, such that the deposit can be made to the system to become a new block producer, the existing block producers have no incentive to include the transaction into the new block as long as there's no penalty for ignoring a transaction. And you may think that, well, that should be punishable, right? If they have a transaction that has been sitting in a pool for a very long time and not including in the block, well, that sounds like a clear violation of the code of conduct of the system, so that should be punishable. It's not that simple, because in the world of blockchain, the communication links are not that reliable. So I always have this plausible deniability that, hey, I didn't say it. My network must have been messing up with me at the moment that transition was being circulated. So I didn't say it. It's not my fault. It's my internet service provider's fault, my mobile provider's fault. For that reason, it is actually fairly difficult to set up the system that gives penalty for ignoring transaction for a very long time. So if that's the case, well, as an existing block producer, if there's another block producer joining the group, then my expected block reward is likely to decrease. Meaning that if you're taking turns, my turn is going to take longer to get back to me. If you're doing probabilistic choice, by having more stake in the system, my probability of getting chosen to be a block producer and getting the reward is going to reduce as well. So as a rational block producer, you can see the guy who's like coming and being excited about being the next block producer and getting the block reward. That guy has no reason to pick up a deposit transaction and welcome a newcomer to the block producer's table. And the next person the same, the next person the same. So as long as there's no penalty for ignoring a deposit transaction, it essentially becomes the right side of the um, picture where a newcomer coming with her own chair, which is signifying to be a deposit, has no seat at the table. By not including the deposit transactions in the canonical blockchain, the existing block producers are essentially closing the gate to any other person to become a new block producer. And the recent scandal that Kubi's document showed that it's not proven, but if it were true, how US block producers were voting for each other, well, that's essentially gatekeeping as well. So this is rational behavior that is not punishable easily, and I'm totally expecting this to happen any day. In security and privacy research, we have this thing, we have this saying that whatever that can go wrong, is going to go wrong. It may not have gone wrong, like right now, but people will discover it, and it is going to go wrong. So I want to be proactive about it, and be able to support the system by designing the relative, well, um, I call it rationality proof consensus, so that the rational users will have to behave for their own incentive, for the benefit of the system, instead of keeping the gate closed. So what is the homework encryption doing on top of this? The new consensus algorithm is only going to help with the block production. It doesn't actually help with the private data operation. And for those who do not know about homework encryption, just a nutshell of it is that you can do any computation on encrypted data as encrypted. So you may learn about the result of the computation, but you cannot learn what is the actual data, values, uh, text, whatever <coughs> that private data originally was. You're not going to learn anything about that. So this is the picture of Gen3, uh, who works at IBM, who made the correct implementation of more free encryption about a decade ago for the first time. And, I mean, this sounds too good to be true, you know? With the private data that we can all work with without learning anything about private data, well, of course it comes with a caveat. 
what he implemented was so slow that we couldn't really use it. It's awesome that any computation is possible, it's Turing complete, but it was so, so slow. So I'm going to tell you about the pros and awesome things about the homomorphic encryption. And in basically, I'm going to tell you that this sounds too good to be true. And the co-founder of us is going to tell you that how his innovative research has enabled this to the reality. The first thing I wanted to explain to you is how homomorphic encryption has no accuracy degradation. So unlike other approaches that in search noise to hide the actual value, because we don't have any noise information involved, there's no accuracy degradation, and it's even more meaningful when you are doing analytics, because you multiply values, and when you multiply values with errors, you're multiplying errors as well. And we don't have to any prior setup. And this is the part that I think homomorphic encryption really fits the spirit of blockchain, the decentralization. Both differential privacy and secure multi-party computation has to do some sort of a setup. The parties involved in this computation have to share either noise production functions, how you create the noise that can kind of cancel out each other later, or they have to share some secrets such that they can participate in this computation without revealing their own secrets. But for you, those of you who actually work in blockchain production, how many times can you get N members of random N members of blockchain community to be online in a relatively short period of time so you can distribute this secret and distribute this privacy budget functions? I think the true spirit of decentralization kind of forces us to sync, um, have asynchronous communication. And for that reason, without requiring the prior setup, I'm willing to share my data now. And I, have to, I don't have to do anything but tomorrow, next week, next month, next year, for other people to use my private data in any particular setup. So as long as I agree that one person, a dedicated person, can use my data, that person can merge my data with Erica's data or John's data here without coming back at me and saying, hey, is it okay? Are you willing to participate in this setup? And for that, I totally believe that more of the encryption fits the decentralized way of life on blockchain better than any other technology. So we don't actually put the data on blockchain for scalability. We only put the thing called switching key. And this is quite magical. And this is how the switching key is enabling merging of different data to be participating in the same computation. So in the beginning, the raw data of mine is, are encrypted in AES and more of encryption together. And by me publishing this particular switching key for a, desk, a particular destination, this destination person or entity can use homomorphically encrypted data. Again, no private data is revealed at this point, but they can use it. I'm going to skip ahead a little bit for the time sake so I can give you the time to really get into the amazing and innovative research by my co-founder. And he's not very good at treating his own horn, so I'm going to stop that for him. Pan is our homomorphic encryption library. It's the world's fastest homomorphic encryption library that can handle floating point arithmetic, which means that any analytics that you want to do beyond simple aggregation, we're the best. And it is definitely better in an industry knows it. And how do you know it? Pan was the winner of i competition in 2017. In other words, in 2017, when there was a secure genomic data mining competition, Pan won hands down. And the next year, 2018, Pan actually lost. The hand team lost. They were not the first. What happened was that his PhD students went postdoc to UCSD, and <laughs> they pushed it further for engineering, um, engineering part of it, and they won. 
And here's even more funny story. Seven entries out of that uh, competition, the top seven, they all used his paper, his library, and they added their own flavor to it. So the top seven entries of the i 2018, you'll see that every single entry has his signature on it. So here, I'm introducing my co-founder and the innovative, the genius cryptographer, Professor Johnny Cha. So Leisure University. Uh, actually, in 2018, uh, genomic computation workshop, I've seen um, two uh, schemes are uh, were used. One scheme is HAN, and the other is was uh, CKKS scheme. So I asked the, to the next person which is CKKS scheme, and then uh, it, I heard that it's Chun Kim Kim Song. So actually, the paper of HAN. So. So actually, so the older schemes used our our paper or our scheme. So I'm a professor of mathematics. So let's start with some simple mathematics. Okay. Okay. So actually, it's very easy to see why Hian is so efficient. The homomorphic computation can be done with only multiplication and addition. Even a uh, very complicated machine learning algorithm can be done with addition and multiplication. But let's see this computation. We want to multiply all eight numbers. So we start with uh, three digit numbers, but later five, like the four digit after the period, and eight and 16. So if after 20 multiplications, you will get millions of bits. It's too huge. So let's imagine how to compute these computations with addition and multiplication. So what do you need for more efficient computation? In floating point computation, we have one more tool, CGEN, round off. We can round, we need to round off the uh, some bit from the LSB. Okay. The HAN is the only one homomorphic encryption scheme which can do this round of operation. That is, all other homomorphic encryption has two operations, addition and multiplication, as a basic unit, but we have one more round of. So, many people, are, so you can see the encryption and decryption are not slow. They are comparable with the, uh, the classical, homo classical encryptions like uh, RSA or ECC. Even more, in RSA and ECC, we can encrypt one element in uh, 6 millisecond, for example. But in HEAN, we can encrypt this one in 7.5 7 millisecond. But we can do this for 1,000 messages. Not one message. So, so in some sense, it's even it's like uh, one thousand times faster. So encryption and decryption are the, not problem. But the problem is multiplication is slow. You know, the for sixteen bit multiplication, it took twenty seven millisecond. It's a, it's a, uh, very slow. So I know many people are worried about the performance of homomorphic encryptions. So I prepared this slide. Yes, it's very slow. The most slow, the slowest operation in homomorphic encryption is bootstrapping. So, uh, in the first paper, 2011, what? to bootstrapping one bit, it took 30 minutes. Really slow, really slow. But after six years, it becomes 0 0.05 second for one bit. It's uh, like uh, 35,000 times, but even more. Uh, this year, we developed more with this hand. We have already 30, 35 times faster result. It will be published next year. You can see this result next year. But to sum up, the result is 1 million. 
now we have one million times faster Humo P coefficient than the previous one. So I think it's time to use Humo P coefficient in practice. So the uh, most interesting example is like machine learning. Machine learning consists of two phases. One is learning phase, second one is prediction phase. In learning phase, you get the algorithm get many data, and then out after the training phase, they output a function. And then in prediction phase, this function uh, we apply we <coughs> we apply this function to on, on some specific input to get the functional value. Uh, in learning phase, we when we want to uh, private, uh, keep some privacy of the input data, we can use several techniques. One is de-identification techniques, and the other is uh, differential privacy, and also we can use multi-part computation and more encryption. So, uh, but here the difference is if you use de-identification uh, or differential privacy and multi-part computation, it's only one time use. That is, when you use differential privacy, if you have more data, you should design different distribution of noise. So, uh, so you, you, you have to redesign. But in OOP encryption, after your computation, you can add and then you, you can keep the previous computation and then can use again and again. This is a <coughs> good thing. And then in prediction phase, we should know which data comes from which who. So in that case, differential privacy cannot be used. Only multi-party computation and OOP encryption can be used, but in multi-part computation, the people should be online to compute. So it's not good for uh, 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 cloud computing. So we think homopy encryption would be ultimate uh, solution for this. So what's the performance of homopy encryption for uh, training, training phase? We got the result on real data this year. We experiment on real financial data, uh, on training phase, on encrypted data. So uh, the one, te one person has 200 features. And then we collected uh, uh, 50, uh, 50 uh, 500,000 people, 0 0.1 million, uh, 0 0.5 uh, million people. And then we uh, perform machine learning, that is logistic regression uh, on increased data. It took 10 hours in a single server. So why 10 hours? The people asked to do this. Um, they, they want to see in a single day. So yeah. So I think it's uh, fairly quite practical, and that it's time to use. Okay, so let, let's, I prepare some FAQ. So many people asked, can we compare two encrypted data? Yes, but be careful. You can not read the widget, which is encrypted. So you need some key. Can we get any information like orders from encrypted data? Not at all, without secret key. You uh, if you want to see the orders, you need secret key. But you can uh, sort all the data, but you cannot see the content. That's the property of Homo encryption. So another question is, oh, is it secure? Uh, uh, even after quantum computer, you ha we have quantum computer? Yes. So it's, a, uh, uh, it's a common belief that even quantum computer cannot break uh, and be hard problems, and then these all the uh, homopy encryptions are based on uh, NP hard problems and some, so with some um, approximate factors. Okay, what is, is it easy to implement homopy encryptions? Actually, it's easy, but the, in that case, the, uh, the performance is not so good. So, uh, why? So, difficult, the difficulty in implementing homopy. Encryption and computation lies on 
we need to control noise control, vector encryption. So we need some tools from algebraic number theory, fast Fourier transform, fast multiplication, and so on. What I mean is, basic computa basic uh, implementation is not so difficult, but uh, uh, optimization requires lots of uh, great tools from uh, um, algorithms and mathematics. So, but you can get, you can find many public libraries. So, including here, so you can try to do some encrypted computation with those uh, <coughs> libraries. Okay. So yeah, so uh, let me uh, we have some applications, but let me stop here and then I will get some uh, few questions you can have. Thank you very much. Any questions? Thank you.